What's up, business heroes? I'm Dave, your self-employment sidekick, and I'm really excited to host another entrepreneur interview for you today. Well, you've heard it said that content is king, and if that's true, then content creators are king makers. And if that's true, then my guest today is a king maker maker. (laughs) Hans Sanders is a writer, a college professor, and the host of the Daily Writer podcast. He also offers coaching to aspiring writers and other creatives. And uh, I'm going to see if I can squeeze a a free coaching session out of him today, although he does offer a lot of his know-how for free in his podcast. But I am really delighted to have Kent join us today. Thank you so much for cool. taking the time to, to chat. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me on. Before we dig in, uh, I want to try something. I actually opened up a rift in the space-time continuum, and I, I can give you 60 seconds to speak back in time and to send a message to an earlier version of yourself right on the cusp of your entrepreneurial endeavors. Is there a message that you would tell an earlier version of Kent, if you could? Boy, that's a great question. I've never heard that question before, but I love it. I would say the message I would send myself is just to start writing earlier because I truly believe that writers rule the world. And uh, when I say that, I, I don't mean necessarily that writers are always in charge of the world or that writers should aspire to lord it over other people. But what I really mean is that everything comes from writers. I mean, literally, every time you go to a play, every time you watch a TV show, Uh, every time you go to a movie or listen to a speech or read a book or a graphic novel or listen to a song, somebody sat down and wrote that or somebody is working together, sit down and wrote that. So there is a really, uh, a really legitimate sense in which writers determine the course of history. They determine the content of everything that you see in here. I mean, writers basically create the culture that we, that we live in and that we enjoy. So Writers have an immense power to change people's minds, to entertain them, to control people's destinies, to control our own destinies through our words. So writing is an immensely powerful form of expression. And I wish that I would have started paying more attention to that when I was younger. Hmm. I I really like how how you laid that all out there. That actually kind of got ahead of of my next question. It sounded like Earlier in your life, you had dabbled and actually continue to uh, dabble with music and some other uh, other arts. Um, and I was just curious why you honed in on writing as kind of your main jam. Well, that's a good question. Uh, why are you really good with these questions? These are things that I had never been asked before. So to give you a super quick backstory, as a kid, I was always involved in the arts. I was... Uh, one of those kids in junior high and high school who was always involved in all the plays, I was in marching band, I was in choirs, I was in swing choir, some places that's called show choir. I just loved it all. And then later in life, I came to really love things like architecture and um, all different forms of music and film and storytelling and all different kinds of, of creative expression. But I've always felt like writing was my main marketable skill. And also writing is such a versatile thing. I mean, you can write blog posts and you can turn that into mm-hmm. books or podcasts or speeches or workshops or whatever. You know, if you can write in one medium, you can translate that to a, a bunch of different other mediums too. So that's really why I honed it on writing, even though I love all those other things as well. That's great. Yeah. The the transferability of writing across yes. all the platforms, it's, it's the foundation. I mean, you touched on this right in the introduction, just how powerful it is, but just practically speaking, if you can write a blog post, you just wrote a script for a YouTube video, you right. wrote a podcast outline, you wrote a chapter of a book. That's awesome. Yep. Um, yep. Reading your a little bit of your story, you share a little bit about you on your website. I was checking that out. It sounds like uh, earlier on, you made a conscious pivot uh, in your career um, into this coaching space and into the podcasting, was there an inciting incident to borrow some writer speak that kind of led to that? There was. In fact, I. it's so funny that you mentioned this because I literally just came from lunch with, um, with a new professor at the school that I just left just to take him out to lunch and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm rooting for you. If there's any way I can help you, let me know. Because it's a, it's a pretty small school, so... I, I'm still very supportive of the college that I just left. I, I love that school. 
I didn't leave on bad terms or anything like that. In fact, it was kind of the opposite where I I had a difficult time leaving because I loved what I did so much. And it, it was it was not an easy decision to go off on my own and really focus on my business. But there was a time a number of years ago, I would say five or six years ago, where our our school was going through a really difficult time. And we had several faculty leave at one time. It was one of those things that happens like once in a generation in an organization where a lot of things just kind of come to a head. A lot of issues and a lot of people leave. There's a lot of hurt feelings. There's a lot of drama and so forth. And that was due to probably a whole variety of reasons. But I saw... And here I'm just being like totally transparent. I saw a lot of people that I were that I was friends with, people that I respected. I saw a lot of people leave badly. Hmm. People who ended their their career there in in a way that that was less than ideal. You know, either they they got let go or they left under duress or with some kind of issue or controversy or something. And I decided that if and when I ever made the transition to doing my business full time, that I was going to leave in the way that I chose. I wanted to be able to leave well. Mm. And a lot of people don't leave their jobs well. They leave under some kind of dark cloud or there's hurt feelings or there's some kind of negative situation of some kind. And I never wanted that to happen to me. So I decided that I was going to start freelance writing. And I got a podcast show notes client, thanks to a good friend of mine, Rye Taylor, who's a podcast producer. And I started just building my business at that point. And then over the years after that, I just built it up more and more, got more clients. And then a couple of years ago, started focusing on ghostwriting books for business clients. And that's really when things started to take off a lot more. Uh, because those are those are more high-level projects. They take a lot more time, but that can also compensate you a lot more than, than just kind of generic freelance writing. So that's when I decided to make the leap and really focus on helping authors, helping writers. And um, it just kind of grew from there. I, I feel like I'm I'm speaking to a, a kindred spirit right now. I actually was also in uh, a university setting as an in-house marketer. And nice. I went through a very similar thing recently, switching to uh, moving into self-employment. I, I love the place. I love the team that I worked with. Uh, and I'm still able to continue working with them, but now from kind of a private contractor. Exactly. exactly. And that's what I do. I'm an adjunct professor yeah. there now. And also just especially I feel this past year has has brought this to light, but self-employment I feel has always kind of got a bad rap as a really unstable sort of a mm-hmm. path, but everything's unstable now. And yes. to be self-employed, you have a, a lot more say over you know how you spend your time and and what direction you want to lean in. If you're leaning all on a, a single point of employment and that goes away, then yep. uh, you're you're left scrambling. Yeah, that, that's, that's a big problem. Absolutely. And that's that's not just education. That's a lot of of different industries. But there's just a lot of issues in higher education right now, which is which is I think a, a big reason why a lot of people want to get out of it. Well. You continue to teach. Are you a writing teacher there? Or- I am. I am doing a class actually in a few weeks. It starts in a few weeks called Writing for Publication. Writing for Publication on blogs, podcasting, books, um, whether you're submitting to a traditional publisher, whether you're self-publishing. It's When we do some marketing stuff in that course too, it's sort of like an all, all-in-one baked-in kind of a course. So my goal with that course is to give students a taste of what it means to be a writer and what it means to put your work out there. So I'm excited about that. It'll be a lot of fun. Nice. I really appreciate the focus on... I mean, that's really practical Mm -hmm. application of writing too. I know sometimes when somebody says, I'm an English major, people kind of roll their eyes. Not, Not to say that you won't write the next great American novel, but there's ways that you can really make a really good living uh, off of off of writing. And uh, you touched on a lot of that earlier. I guess the older that I get, the more impatient that I get with industries or careers that are devoted to picking apart other people's creative work. For example, movie critics, um, English teachers, other kinds of things where basically your whole job is to analyze stuff that somebody else has created. There was a time when I used to write for this large publication and I was... One of the areas that I oversaw was their 
uh, movie review section. And there was one day I was working on a review. I forget what movie it was for. And I just had this overwhelming thought of why am I spending so much time critiquing somebody else's stuff instead of writing my own stuff? And I think a lot of people go into those careers because you're, you're involved in things that you really are interested in. Like maybe you really love storytelling and novels or, you know, 17th century British literature or something like that. Maybe you really love that. And so you're getting to kind of play in that sandbox. But if you're not really creating something of your own, you're not really contributing to the conversation. You know, I, I think there is limited value in, in jobs or roles where you're always just analyzing something that somebody else has created. I would much rather see people get out there and write their own stuff. I mean, I don't want to spend my life just being a critic. I want to spend my life being a creator. And, but that takes courage. And that takes putting yourself out there and conquering your own fears. And I feel like part of, part of my mission in life is to help two groups of people specifically educators and pastors to get their stuff out there and really impact the world. Because these, these are two, pe- two kinds of people who can create stuff. They can write, they can communicate, but oftentimes they're, they're stuck in situations or vocations that don't really encourage them to put their stuff out there beyond their own limited setting. That, I just went off on a whole tangent there. So sorry if that's not the direction you want to go. Uh, that actually segues nicely. I was curious, among the people that you work with, what are some of those challenges, those obstacles you find them frequently running into and holding them back from being able to just create and, and be a producer? I think the biggest fear that we have is it's the fear of what is somebody else going to think of my work? We're afraid of not being good enough because there's all these best-selling authors out there. There's all these successful people. At least it appears to us that they're successful. But if I put my stuff out there, is it going to be judged to be lacking? Is it going to be judged not as good as somebody else's stuff? But the, the truth is that people are not paying near as much attention to us as we think they are. You know, like, like Dave, when you put this YouTube video out there, is there a part of your brain that goes, what if somebody watches this and they don't like it? Maybe there's something there's something they would critique about the video or the audio or your questions or the way Ken Sanders answered the questions or, or whatever. I mean, there's a part of all of us that worries, what is somebody else going to think about that? But the truth is that we're all consuming so much stuff. We watch or listen to this one thing, we read it, then we basically move on to the next thing. So I think the fear that we have that people are always paying close attention to us is not really accurate. It's just a perception that we have. At least that's my take on it. On, on the flip side, before we started this interview, I, I shared with you just how much I appreciated the positive feedback and just how life-giving that can be for somebody. Uh, I mean, it's for as much fear as there is about receiving negative criticism, the payoff of hearing somebody say, thank you. I, I really liked what you said there. And uh, mm-hmm. that was that was a great interview. Uh, you really, you know, put some wind in my sails. And uh, so thank you. Right. What are some other common uh, things you help coach your clients through? One thing that I see all the time, and I see this in myself still sometimes, is people getting paralyzed because it's just too much. You know, for example... Um, when people want to start a podcast, it's very easy to feel intimidated by the technology of it because you think, okay, where do I get a podcast guest? What microphone do I get? How do I upload stuff to a podcast host? Which podcast host do I use? How often should I post? What should my artwork be? What should I call my podcast? It's, you know, you think of, of 28 different questions that are unanswered in your mind and that is so overwhelming, you just stop. And I've Mm. had that happen so many times before. But I would just encourage anyone who's dealing with feeling paralyzed at a creative project is to just just list out the steps in order that you need to do or list out the questions that you have and then take the very first thing on the list and address that. Ask somebody that you know about how to solve that problem. Or if you want to spend a few bucks, hire somebody to solve that problem for you. Or just Google it. Get on YouTube and find a video about how to do whatever it is that you're trying to do. I guarantee whatever it is that you're trying to do, somebody else has already figured it out and they've probably made a YouTube video about it. In fact, there's probably 15 people who've made YouTube videos about it. 
Yeah. I mean, my goodness, I've, you, you just have to not get paralyzed by things. Just take it one step at a time. You can figure it out. And if you're just willing to do that, then it's really amazing what you can accomplish. If you're willing to kind of get over that fear of, of being paralyzed and you don't really know what to do. So just take the next logical step and keep knocking down those dominoes and you'll get there. So that's one thing. There's probably a lot of other ones, but that's, that's definitely a big one that comes to mind. What would you tell a perfectionist like myself? I uh, People have told me that I'm a pretty good writer and I, mm-hmm. I want to believe that that's true, but it takes me forever to get something out on a piece of paper that's not time well spent for me. Yeah. And that's that's a really common problem too that I very, very much relate to because I'm a recovering perfectionist as well. So there are two things that have really helped me. Whenever I write something, I typically create what I just call a vomit draft. It's a horrible image, <laughs> but but it really communicates the idea well, which is just get something down there. Get a draft of it down. Don't pay any attention to spelling, grammar, punctuation, if you need to set that aside. Just get a draft of whatever it is that you're working on down as fast as humanly possible. And when you do that, you you create a lot of really positive momentum. Let's say you're working on a, on a blog post that's 700 words or even 500 words. You can actually write a blog post of 500 words in probably 10 minutes if you really, really want to. I mean, if you just get it out as fast as possible with no concern for quality, you can do it really, really fast, especially if you dictate it. That Then you can get it done even faster. When you look at something, let's say, for example... Um, um, let's just say any book that that you see, it didn't come out that way initially. It started off as a as a draft that probably wasn't very good. Then it was edited and probably multiple times, and then it was proofread and copy edited and, and all that stuff before it took its final form. So you can't compare your first draft to somebody else's final draft. So I would just say get it out there as fast as humanly possible. And when you do that, then you have a complete piece to work with, and it's way easier to edit a complete piece than it is to try and create a perfect piece bit by bit, I think. So that's one thing. The other thing that has really helped me a lot is that I just try to create things at a B level. I realize that I'm a perfectionist and I can spend inordinate amounts of time on any given thing. If I know they're a solid B, then that's probably an A for everybody else because like my own personal A plus is so unattainable, like in my own mind, that I would never reach it and I'd never finish anything. So I just shoot for a B or at max a B plus. You know, I do a daily podcast and you can't be a perfectionist when you do a daily podcast. So I just get it done. I do the best I can. I record it. My assistant takes care of uploading and show notes. And then I move on to the next thing. And I I just don't worry about it. So I think there's a sense in which you just have to be okay with doing B-level work because most of the successful artists in the world they're not, they're not perfectionists necessarily. They they create stuff the best they can. They put it out there and they move on to the next thing. So that's just kind of the way I try to operate. Although I wrestle with perfectionism every single day, and it's really difficult to shut that voice off. That is awesome. That is really genuinely helpful stuff because uh, cool. we hold ourselves to such a high standard, and when we create something we see it as like a direct representation of us and we want to put the absolute best face forward. But like you were talking about earlier, there's so much other stuff out there. It's not that people aren't going to see it and not care about us, but when we're sitting there and critiquing ourselves, we're, we're just brutal. So I like (laughs) holding ourselves to a lower standard, just getting something out there and realizing that at the end of the day, that's going to be more than good enough for the people who are going to be consuming it. And most people aren't going to bat an eye at the flaws. That is, yeah, that's gold. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and something else I would, and thank you, by the way, something else I would tack on there is, and this is something that I have been thinking about a lot lately. And I haven't talked about this anywhere very much because I'm not sure if it's actually true, but it seems like it's true. So I'm kind of just like ruminating on it a lot. And it's the idea that, I'm not sure that any of us really perceives reality correctly in the sense of, I think it's impossible to be really objective about your own creative work. Like like my own lens toward my own work is so distorted that I'm not sure if I can really see it objectively the way that 
that a more objective reader would. I don't know if that makes any sense or not, but I think there is something that's kind of healthy about realizing you can't really see reality in the sense that other people see your work. And then this is why it's critical to bring in other people to help you with it, like editors or beta readers or other kinds of people who can really be another voice of of reason because none of us has the ability to, to see our work the way that other people see it because I'm just far too close to it. I agree with that. That makes total sense. I, even I can't hear my own voice the way other yeah. people hear it. And when I yep, watch yeah. this video and analogy. listen back on this recording, part of me is going to be like, Ugh, really? That's what I sound like? Um, but that's just I, I something just you, you kind mean. of have to get past. And you know, that's how everybody else accepts you. And again, you know, they, they haven't had a problem with how you actually sound, but yeah. when it doesn't line up with your own standards, that, that creates a big kind of conflict just in yourself, but it's not yeah. a problem and you just have to move past it. I totally agree. So my main takeaway from this conversation uh, is to start mm-hmm. and start and also start. And finish. Ah, Yes. That's, a lot of people start, that's, but don't That's finish. important too, isn't it? Yeah, finish that book, man. If there's, if I could just go out and, and be a book evangelist for everybody, there's so many people who've started books, but they don't finish them. And people can't read a book that you haven't finished. Even if you don't think it's the greatest thing in the world, just finish that sucker, have an editor look at it, get a good cover design, put it out there on Amazon. And it's amazing what happens when you put a book out there. It goes places that you would be shocked. Well, this has been a great conversation. Do you have any final words of encouragement to aspiring writers or other people who are looking into uh, kind of putting their creativity uh, out there uh, as a career? Yeah, I would say if you want to do it as a career, then you can absolutely do it. I, I can only really speak to to writers because that's my career. I'm not a professional musician or a painter or an architect or any of those kinds of things. But there are plenty of people who do that for a living. So I would say if you really want to write for a living and, and make a full-time living at it, then go for it. There's no reason why you can't. And I can, I can promise you, as somebody who came from the worlds of church ministry and higher education, those are about as far away from business as you can get. In fact, there's two professions that, you know, those are two of the lowest paid professions. Like of if you're going to be a, a quote-unquote professional in something, those are just areas where you don't really develop a lot of business skills unless you go for it and learn those on your own. And that's what I've had to do. Thankfully, I've gotten around some people who've been enormously helpful to me and I've learned how to do it. And my goodness, I feel like if I can make a career of this, then anybody can because (laughs) I've had to kind of scratch and claw my way to build this, but but I did it. It took a few years and, and you can do it too. There's absolutely no reason why you can't do it. Ken, thank you so much for your time. If you want to hear more from Kent, uh, you can subscribe to the Daily Writer podcast where he shares more great nuggets like this every weekday. Is that right? Every day, seven days a week. Wow. Where else can people learn more about you? I would say they can go to dailywriterlife.com. That's the website for my Daily Writer community. I, I run a membership community called The Daily Writer. And we talk a lot about habits, mindset, goals. We've got people in the group who are doing business books, podcasting. Uh, One guy who just released a novel, a crime novel. Mm -hmm. And uh, another person in the group who just released a book of short stories and has a novel coming out in a couple months. Lots of book writers in the group. All kinds of fun stuff going on. Yeah. It sounds like you got lots going on. Thank you again for taking some time to spend with us. My pleasure. Thanks, Dave. Totally my pleasure. And thanks so much to everybody who tuned in. I'll be linking to Kent's resources in the description below. And if you like this interview, don't keep it a secret. Show your support by hitting the like button and share it with a writer friend of yours. I want as many people as possible to benefit from some of these gold brain nuggets that Kent shared with us today. Also, be sure to subscribe. There are more great interviews in the hopper. I've been really appreciative of all the support I've been receiving recently and people reaching out wanting to be a part of the show. And on this channel, we have tips, tool reviews, and other content to help you get the most out of your business. Because if you're running a business, even if you're just freelancing on the side, you're doing something heroic. You are adding value and trying to make the world a better place. Even if it's just 
providing for your family a little bit better or serving clients and meeting the needs that they have. That's important work and it matters. And I'm here to support you any way I can. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next one.